Hello, this is Bill Dix with the North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Streaming Show, uh, Lessons of Vietnam. My co-host, who's usually with me, Bob Matthews, uh, educational czar, uh, teacher for 40-some years, master teacher is uh, out of town. He went back home to uh, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh area, uh, he, so he's not with us tonight. Talked to him earlier today. Uh, he says it's as hot there as it is here, and today it was pretty nice here compared to what we have had. But we do have a special guest with us tonight, uh, NCBI member, uh, Vietnam veteran, uh, Paul White. And uh, uh, Paul, thank you for being with us and uh, glad to have you tonight. And we've been talking about having you on for a long time. Uh, Paul has uh, got spent some time in the bush. He spent some time at, uh, at, at a base camp, some time at a uh, fire support base. Uh, got quite a story. Uh, he's written a, uh, his own uh, memoirs. Uh, not certain when he's going to publish them or, or whatever, but uh, he's written those. Uh, Paul, let's start out with uh, where are you from? Uh, originally, Greensboro, North Carolina. Greensboro, North Carolina. Another, yeah. no, another North Carolina native. You bet it. I didn't know there was that many of us around. And uh, where were you? What were you doing when? Uh, did you join the military? Or did you get drafted? Or uh, I was drafted. I'd finished. Um, uh, college. Uh, I was a music major at uh, UNC uh, Greensboro, and uh, after I graduated, couldn't find a job. Uh, I did work for my dad, who uh, tuned, rebuilt, and serviced pipe organs. But uh, when I would uh, go to apply for a job somewhere, they'd ask me what my draft number was. Um, and uh, once they found out it was 116, they'd say, check back with us after you get back. Well, I, my, during my time, we still had the draft. We hadn't gone to the lottery yet, but I had somewhat the yeah. same same story there, except I didn't finish college. They decided the college finished me. <laughs> they, ex, they actually expected me to study and, and so forth when I went to college. Oh, wow. And, and I couldn't believe that. It just wasn't, you know. But, uh, yeah, I couldn't get a job either, so I can appreciate that. Uh, where did you go to basic? Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Uh -huh. That's straight. I, cause I went to... I, I went to um, I went to Fort Bragg. Okay. Of course, you were you were uh, in seventy. Uh, yeah, I was drafted in October of nineteen seventy. In October nineteen seventy. Okay. Uh, I went in six. Uh, Uncle Sam uh, got to see me in in sixty six. So. All right, you're a little ahead of me. Yeah. Uh, so you went through basic down there, right. and uh, when you finished there, what were your orders from there? Uh, I received uh, my orders to go to uh, radio operators school. Uh, I was the 05 Bravo 20 was the full designation uh, for that, and that was at Fort Jackson also. Okay. So 11 Bravo, that's uh, some people call that 11 bullet stopper, and so you became a 11 bullet stopper with the radio on your back. Uh, I did. I sure did. Okay. Uh, and how did that? How did the, going through uh, radio? Uh, uh, let's see, radio telephone operator. Every time I say radio telephone operator, I think of my aunt who was a telephone <laughs> operator with, with uh, Southern <laughs> Bell. But, uh, it wasn't quite that way, was it? Uh, no, but actually, uh, the first Firebase I was on, Firebase uh, Sherman, uh, the, the first job they gave me with communications was mm -hmm. sitting in front of a switchboard and plugging in the cable so that the, the uh, people could talk um, amongst themselves on the Firebase. So that was kind of like your aunt, yeah. uh, but then uh, I soon moved to uh, the radios, and uh, at Firebase Sherman, I think they had as many as six that you had to listen to at one time, and uh, it was a little nerve-wracking at first. Just, uh, number one, there was a lot of background noise, yeah. uh, and secondly, being able to understand uh, what was being said, it took a little time to develop an ear for, yeah. for all that. And I imagine if you had someone out there on the other end of the radio, it was like from maybe the north. <laughs> yeah, understanding them was was even uh, was even tougher. Uh, since you yeah, were but you knew you knew who you were listening to at least. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, you finished up uh, uh, radio telephone operator school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess they gave you a little few days off uh, to go home, or yeah, I had about uh, thirty days. Thirty leave, days, I believe okay. It was. Yeah. Uh, and then they put you on a Big Bird, and uh, where did they take you? Uh, well, they took me to Fort Ord to okay. begin with, okay. uh, and I was at Fort Ord 
I believe, for 11 days. Uh, what did you do for 11 days at Fort Ord? Uh, we just had to stay within um, a certain building. We could only leave that building to go to um, uh, the various meals that uh, we would have. And they had a cot there, and we just basically hung out uh, for 11 days. Huh. Because I went from, uh, they didn't give me that opportunity. I went straight from uh, Raleigh, Durham to uh, uh, Travis Air Force Base, and then they uh, shipped me right on out. But I okay. flew over on uh, a military plane. Okay. I did, I did, did you fly over on military or? or uh, no, actually, private? it was uh, United Airlines. United still. Airlines, yeah. okay. So you flew United. Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, and I believe that you landed at a place called Benoit. I did. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, tell us about uh, landing at Benoit. You're finally in this place called Vietnam where you know people are shot at you and so forth. What else, what else? You, what did you know about Vietnam on your way there before you went there? Uh, well, not much. Mostly uh, what the drill instructors and in basic had uh, um, drilled into our heads about, uh, uh, you know, that we better pay attention to what they were trying to teach us or we could wind up... Uh, a casualty uh, over there. So, you know, I, my knowledge of Vietnam before I went there was really pretty um, pretty lean, I would yeah. say. I, I think most of us who who went over it uh, uh, knew very little about uh, Vietnam unless right. they, unless maybe you went through some specialized training before you got there. Uh, so you landed, and I remember well when that plane door opened. Tell me a little bit about uh, your, first inst- uh, your first thoughts when my that first plane door opened. And you started out, you walked out on the uh, okay. tarmac or the steps down. Yep. I remember the heat, it was 7 o'clock in the morning, and the heat was already pretty oppressive. I think it was probably more the humidity because the uh, temperature was about 75, but the uh, humidity must have been about 200. Um, but um, I remember uh, that very distinctly and also a particular, uh, let's call it a stench, um, that I have not smelled um, before nor after um, coming home from Vietnam. I, <laughs> you know, I, I, that's the one of the things that, you know, depending on where you were in Vietnam, when you were there, and what you did, every Vietnam veteran story is different except that one thing. <laughs> when that plane door opened, the heat, uh-huh. humidity, and the smells came in. Right. Sure enough. Uh, we all relate back to the smells, but I can tell you today the smells are gone. Uh, I'm not certain whether it's because they got flush toilets or, <laughs> or uh, they don't throw the garbage out as much because they still do, but uh-huh. uh, on the diesel fuel and the right. uh, uh, cordite from, uh, from artillery and so forth, I'm not mm-hmm. certain exactly, but uh, a lot of those smells are gone, but it is, it's ingrained in all of us as... Uh, yeah, it's it's quite unique. So uh, you they put you on a uh, on buses, right? Uh, kind of like school buses, or seemed like uh, mine was like a school bus, but uh, yeah, sort of. Uh, yeah, it wasn't orange, but uh, no, it or was yellow. The, but, that uh, Army wonderful uh, green. Yeah, color, that's yeah. it. Right. Okay. And then they took you to uh, what you call Camp Alpha. Uh, right. To me, when, when I got there. Uh, in 67, it was called just 90 replacement. Uh-huh. Uh, and what happened to you when you got there? Well, uh, the first thing I remember is they put me on KP, and I was on KP for three days in a row. Three days in a row. Right. I, only, I only got the first day. Oh, okay. I, lucky. I wasn't as special Lucky as Bill. So I th- they put you on KP for three days now. Right. If I remember correctly, you know, uh, they didn't tell you a whole lot when you got there other than to go to KP. They didn't right. tell you where the bunkers were. or what. And right. you got there with no weapons, nothing. All you had on was the clothes you wore, right. uh, basically. And they didn't tell you what to do if you came under attack or rockets came in or, or whatever. You just right. kind of, uh, well, that, you were kind of a body. Uh, yeah. Now, after uh, the first three days, they did set us up for uh, in-country training and then we did get some exposure to uh, the kind of things that you're referring to. Tell me about in-country training at, at Out Camp Alpha. Uh, well, we, we came in, obviously, as a large group. Mm-hmm. And then uh, they broke us up into smaller groups. And uh, you have um, uh, been to, say, some of the um, uh, school sports activities outside where they have 
sections of bleachers, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so they had a, a small section of a uh, bleachers set up for um, our small group. I, I couldn't tell you exactly how many uh, of us there were, but I would say um, in the neighborhood of 15, no more than 20 for certain, and they uh, uh, kind of initiated us with um, uh, demonstrations of uh, weapons. They had a, uh, a Vietnamese uh, person who demonstrated uh, how a sapper might attack a fire base, uh, negotiating through the concertina wire and mm -hmm. the uh, barbed wire and so forth. And that was uh, he, he just wearing a loincloth and carrying a satchel uh, just to uh, show us how vulnerable we were to uh, attack by these I just sappers. watched a Vietnamese movie a, a movie about Vietnam recently that uh -huh. showed the showed the same thing I can't name the <laughs> name of the movie now but uh, they showed that the guy crawling through uh, Papa Song crawling, crawling through and so forth yeah it, they did it with ease yeah. so after three days they uh, they sent you someplace yeah I was uh, after the in-country training and I was assigned to the 1st Cav Division uh, and then um uh, they moved me to the uh, headquarters, uh, which was Benoit for the first calf. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there for a few days, um, and I guess it was about May the 15th. I arrived in country on May the 4th, and it was about May the 15th when I was actually um, flown out to Firebase Sherman for the first time. At, at uh, that Benoit, the, the, when you first got assigned to the first cab there, that's where they gave you all your equipment, your uh, right, and, and so forth. Yeah, and, and Benoit was you know much like a, a city uh, by comparison to being on the firebase yeah. or at along the along then, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they had permanent uh, structures there, barracks uh, with beds. And um, so anyway, I was there for a few days before they mm -hmm. sent me out to Firebase Sherman. Yeah, I, I know uh, just uh, for benefit of some of the young people who are watching, we see today soldiers going off to war and they got their they got all this equipment on, they're carrying their rifles and so forth. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I guess they didn't think we were smart enough to do all that <laughs> when we went to Vietnam. Yeah. They, they gave it all to you after you got there. Right, right. And... Uh, which may have been good uh, if you were part of the McNamara 10,000 <laughs> right. uh, who couldn't, you know, fog a mirror. Uh, so now you're at 1st Cab and they sent you out to the 1st uh, uh, Fire Support Base. Right. Now tell people watching a little bit, what's a uh, fire support base? Well, they were scattered throughout the, uh, the countryside, and, and basically it was a, um, um, a small uh, fortress, if you, if you will. Uh, some of them were... Uh, built in uh, uh, a circular fashion. Others were square or um, uh, rectangular uh, in shape, but um, all of them that I was on uh, had an earthen berm that uh, had been pushed up all around so that you had the protection there. The um, area just outside the fire base was uh, cleared, so you had a clear line of uh, fire for um, maybe... Uh, you know, 250, 300 yards. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they varied in size. The smallest one I was on was probably 100 square meters. Uh, the largest one uh, was probably took in um, an acre or more. Uh, so it, uh, it it depended on the the reason and the place of the fire base. Essentially, the purpose was to provide. Uh, artillery, artillery, mortar, and other uh, fire support to the troops that were out in the in the bush, mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes we needed all the help we could get. And y'all, uh, yeah, the fire bases had their own electricity and water, running water. Yeah, we had uh, generators. The running water, no, uh, th that was brought to us in huge uh, black bladders. Mm -hmm. uh, and thinking back on it, I'm not sure why they dropped those bladders outside the the fire base uh, because um, it seems to me that if uh, one of our um, North Vietnamese uh, friends or Viet Cong wanted to come up and contaminate the water, uh, that would be fairly easy to do. But nevertheless, there were these bladders that were probably 500 gallons or so, 
and we would um, go out to the bladders and fill up um, these containers that were uh, probably five gallon containers, bring them back into the fire base and use it for um, washing or uh, cooking or drinking, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Uh, what kind of living conditions did you have at a fire base? Um, uh, pretty um, nasty. Um, I took quite a few pictures uh, while I was over there. Um, some of them were worse than others, and it depended on the, the season. Uh, for instance, in the um, uh, latter part of May, early part of June, I was on Firebase uh, Pat and Far Firebase Pecos. It rained. Um, it just seemed like all the time. And the, the mud was um, over the top of your boots, about halfway up your, uh, your shins. Um, and the mud at Firebase Pat, I distinctly remember, would cake up on, your, on the bottom of your boots and you'd have to, to stop uh, every now and then just to scrape off the mud um, because it would cake up six to eight inches on the bottom of your boots and I'd never experienced anything like that. Uh, and of course, we had um, uh, hooches that uh, we lived in and there was no air conditioning. So it was, it was pretty miserable particularly when you first got there and had not become acclimated to the, uh, the climate and the humidity and the It's hooch you're talking about. It have a concrete floor or a dirt floor? Or? Uh, it, was, it was pretty much uh, dirt, although we did put um, uh, ammo crates uh, on, on the ground and put our air mattresses on the uh, ammo crates. Mm -hmm. So you slept on the air mattresses? And uh, yeah, went on the fire base, yeah. we did. Mm -hmm. Now, if you wanted the hot water to shave or whatever, did y'all have those immersion heaters or you just didn't Say what? have hot water? <laughs> Say what? What's an immersion heater? <laughs> no, we, uh, if we wanted hot water, um, and usually um, if we're taking a shower, we'd just take one of those five-gallon containers and let it sit in the sun for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'd just dump the water into the Australian shower that uh, uh, was provided. Um, and... Um, that was our uh, that was our hot water. If we needed it for cooking or whatever, there were heat tabs. Or uh, if you wanted to do it a lot quicker than that, uh, we'd light up a, a block of C4, and uh, you could boil a, a canteen cup of of water with a, a pound of C4 in about 30 seconds. Mm, okay. All right. Uh, if you'd like to call in and ask Paul some questions <laughs> or make comments, uh, give us a call at 919-518. 9773 and uh, ask Paul questions uh, about his uh, tour as a radio operator, uh, some questions about fire support bases or whatever else you want to ask him about. Uh, you can go to on Skype. It's Computers 2K Voice. Uh, either way, you can go in uh, and, and give us uh, contact us, and we'd be glad to talk to you, uh, listen to your comments or questions, and uh, we'll get Paul to uh, give you an answer. Uh, so that's a firebase. Now, tell me some of the firebases you at, and where do they come up with these names for firebases? <laughs> anyway, um, I, I'm not too sure, uh, but I think it probably had to do with uh, somebody with a higher pay, pay grade than mine mm -hmm. that wanted to name it after someone in their family or uh, some place that uh, they were from. I, I was on firebase uh, Sherman, Pat, Pecos, uh, Brazos. Um, 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 Pace, uh, Gibraltar, uh, Powder Ridge. Uh, there were uh, 12 or 13 fire bases that mm -hmm. uh, I was on. I'd, I'd been a while since I thought about it, so I just yeah. couldn't rattle them right off. You know, uh, thinking about a while ago during the rainy season, uh, it's always tell people in classes Vietnam has two, two seasons hot, wet, and hot, and dry. <laughs> Okay. And uh, it's not unusual for 12 inches of rain in 24 hours. Right. Uh, during the rainy season, how in the world did you ever get dry? You didn't. You just stayed wet all the time? Uh, pretty much. Because if, if you weren't wet from the rain, you were wet right. uh, from the sweat. Right. Yes, because um, it, was, it was warm, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, you got a little bit of relief when you were under a shower, but as soon as you stepped out uh, to dry off and uh, so forth, you yeah. were sweating again. It yeah. was... Uh, it made you appreciate uh, home that much more. Mm -hmm. 
Now, at night, did the generators run all night, or uh, did you have lights in your hooch and that sort of stuff, or was it used for the radios? And uh, They were just used for the uh, tactical operations center, the radios, and uh, uh, there might be a, a, a light someplace else, but uh, in the, the hooches, uh, which were basically two-man um, structures, uh, we either used a candle or we used um, uh, flashlights, but uh, as far as illuminating the uh, fire base to make a target out of it, uh, mm -hmm. that was discouraged. So you didn't watch a lot of television on fire support uh, base? No, I don't uh, recall seeing a television uh, on the fire base. Yeah. Uh, I know there, you were, you were single when you were there. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. How old were you, by the way? I was 22, uh, arrived um, at age 22. You're an old and, guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and had my 23rd birthday about um, three and a half months yeah. uh, after I was in so how, how did the young guys treat the old man that was there? Just, uh... <laughs> um, just like I was one of them, actually. Yeah. Uh, I guess one of the things out there for entertainment or whatever was basically getting a letter from home or, and writing letters and so oh, yeah. forth. and. Well, and I soon found that if I wanted to get letters, I had to write letters. Uh huh. And so I would uh, sit down and write three or four uh, letters uh, in a day, you know, when I had the opportunity to do that. Uh, and I got uh, uh, quite a few letters back. In fact, when I was writing my uh, memoir, uh, the, the first source of information that I had to uh, go back on uh, were over 500 uh, pieces of correspondence. Uh, hmm. Some of those were letters that I had written home and my mother had saved, and uh, that was instrumental in be being able to put down an accurate timeline uh, and also reflect uh, my thoughts and feelings uh, at different times throughout my tour of duty. And then uh, I had um, um, a large number of letters that were sent to me and the way that would work, uh, I would receive the letters, I'd read them a few times, then I'd uh, put them in an envelope addressed to myself back here uh, in the States. And so when I got back, there was uh, almost all the letters that were sent to me. There was one time that we were um, instructed uh, to burn the letters uh, when I was out in the bush um, on a particular mission uh, because they didn't want to run the risk of them falling into enemy hands if we mm -hmm. were... Um, uh, okay. Captured or, or if the the letters were obtained somehow or another. Now, what did you do when you were? At, what was your job on the fire support bases? I don't think you probably didn't have that little plug-in telephone no. situation. No, that didn't last long. They they moved me to the tactical operations center, and uh, they're depending on the the size of the fire fire base and so forth. Uh, we had to monitor uh, between two and six radios at the same time. Uh, we would uh, take uh, locations, uh, locs from uh, the uh, platoons and, that were in the bush uh, and get uh, sit reps or situation reports. So uh, these radios them. you were listening to and monitoring, they weren't playing music or anything? Yeah. No. Uh, uh, what, no. What was what was the typical coming in from... Uh, uh, on the radios, that was be groups that are out in the bush, uh, their situation, whether they were under a fire or they were at ambush or just exactly what they were doing. Is that? Uh, yeah, that that pretty much covers uh, the communication between the fire base and my position and the guys out in the bush. But we also received communication from the battalion level uh, coming from the other direction. Yeah. So I was kind of in the middle. Uh, there and uh, oftentimes relayed messages yeah. uh, from uh, the guys in the bush to the battalion or the battalion to the guys in the bush. So you were the Navajo Navajo code talkers without without the Navajo and without the code. Without the code, okay. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, you're out there and you're at different uh, support bases. Why did they move you from one to the other? I mean, did a whole group move and and leave the fire base, or they just said, okay, it's time for Paul to move. He's been here a while. I think it's because they just got tired of me and uh, decided to move me from one to another. Um, some of the uh, fire bases, um, 
uh, probably a couple of them we just completely abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, but the other ones, uh, well, my, I was promoted pretty rapidly when I was uh, in Vietnam. And so I just got moved from one place to the other. I eventually became the uh, chief radio operator uh, for the battalion. And often um, they would move me to another location just to uh, set up communications mm -hmm. and uh, do, you know, what the chief radio operator was supposed to do. Now, if I remember correctly, you said when you were in college, you uh, were a music major. That's right. Uh, did you, uh, what did you do in Vietnam that would uh, re re reflect what you uh, did as a music major? Okay, well, uh, let me go back a little bit further. Um, when I graduated and the draft was uh, upon me, some of my friends who were in military bands, um, said, you know, there was no reason to join, that uh, as well as I played trumpet, uh, that I wouldn't have any problem getting into a military band. So if you had went ahead and you could have went ahead, after you got your draft notes, you could have went ahead and joined the Army with the contract to go to uh, a, a military band. Perhaps, if you okay. could trust the co contracts. I'm still, I, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm still waiting for my <laughs> ticket to Germany that the recruiter told me I could get, and it's only been 45 years. <laughs> okay. So I can relate to that. All right, right. okay. So uh, anyway, uh, I took my chances. I was drafted and went to Fort Jackson. Uh, they came around within the first few days and asked if there was anybody who wanted to audition uh, for the Army band. So I raised my hand. I auditioned for the, the band and... Uh, uh, scored uh, 131 out of a possible 140 points and uh, was told that uh, that's the best audition they'd heard in well over three months. So uh, the, the Badmaster certainly gave me encouragement that uh, that's where I would be. Uh, after I finished basic training, I did get my orders for radio operator school. I called the Bandmaster and uh, uh, essentially I was told that my audition card was not picked up by the computer in Washington. Uh, it seemed to me that would be a mistake that could be easily corrected by the Army. Um, not so. Um, and I kept pursuing that uh, with the bandmaster and so forth. And in fact, at one point, uh, he told me that uh, what I should do is start flunking my uh, test in radio operator school. Um, so I did that. And it wasn't long before I was in the uh, CO's office, uh, the company that uh, did the radio operator uh, school. And he told me if I didn't straighten up, um, I'd find myself in the stockade for a few days to think about it. So miraculously, my grades got better um, pretty quick after that. Uh, and he did tell me that when I got to my next duty station, I could possibly um, audition for a band there. Mm -hmm. My next duty station was uh, Vietnam. Uh, I signed into the first cab, and then they let me go to Long Bend to audition for the 266 Army Band uh, there. And I passed that audition. I got a letter of acceptance. I took it back to the first cab and was told, sorry, we have a shortage of RTOs, uh, so we can't release you to go to the band. Uh, you are a non-expendable um, personnel would be the category that you're in, and uh, we just cannot let you go to the band. Well, it wasn't long after that before I was sent to the bush, and those guys are classified as expendable. Yeah. Uh, and on top of that, uh, in fact, I recently uh, read in Vietnam uh, magazine that the average life expectancy of an RTO in a firefight um, was 15 seconds. So somehow or another, I went from being non-expendable to the most expendable uh, position. Yeah, the RTO is the guy that's standing right there with the, with the officer uh, right. who's the first one to get shot, and then the RTO's got that antenna sticking up, so they got they got a better target. Is that Right, pretty good target. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, uh, you never did make it in the band then? Uh, no, but uh, uh, I did keep hounding them uh, about that, and so they knew I wanted to be in the band, and uh, in October of 71, we had um, three Kit Carson scouts that were uh, killed at Firebase Pace. Mm -hmm. uh, now, tell us what a Kit Carson scout is. Sorry. 
Well, my understanding uh, is that uh, most, if not all of them, are from North Vietnam, and they were uh, normally soldiers. They were, they were, they were uh, soldiers with the North, Northern Army. That's right. And uh, under the South Vietnamese uh, government's uh, program of open arms, yeah, which Chiu, is called Chu Hoi, yeah. uh, they would welcome them to the uh, side of the South, mm -hmm. and uh, with their expertise of... Um, having been in the uh, uh, NVA, North Vietnamese Army, they could go out with us on missions and perhaps help us uh, spot bunkers. And if we captured a, uh, an enemy soldier, they would be the first line of interrogation, speaking the language uh, and so forth. So uh, uh, I would say that um, there were three uh, Kid Carson scouts that I think I worked with Normally, when I was in the bush, they were right behind me. There was the uh, officer of the unit, whether it's a platoon or a company, most of the time a platoon, uh, then me, and then the Kit Carson scout was behind me. So uh, um, it was an interesting arrangement. Yes. Uh, Paul brought a PowerPoint, and we're going to pause for a moment and, uh, and watch the PowerPoint. And, and Paul, kind of tell us what we're looking at as you... Uh, just watch the monitor there. Okay, and uh, there are uh, about 60-some pictures. So I'm going to f sort of fly through okay. the descriptions. Uh, this is uh, the patch for the 1st Cav Division. Um, and this is, uh, this, by the way, uh, would be a presentation I would make uh, in the high school through the Lessons of Vietnam this class. This is your memoir we talked about. Uh, actually, these are just excerpts. Okay. Uh, right. And pictures. Um this is a bamboo pit viper. Uh, I had an occasion to uh, uh, kill one of these. In fact, let me just uh, regress here for a little bit. Um, there was a uh, probably the most one of the most decorated uh, and youngest officers in Vietnam was uh, David Christian. He uh, um, was known for his unorthodox uh, ways of uh, combat and so forth, and he had a mantra uh, that. Um, was over uh, his headquarters or whatever that uh, uh, killing is our business and business is good. Well, I took that uh, mantra myself, uh, kind of retrospectively looking at it now, because when I got to uh, to Vietnam, I did a lot of killing too. But uh, it was mostly uh, uh, this bamboo pit viper that you saw. Uh, that's that's not the one, but uh, that's uh, that is a bamboo pit mm -hmm. viper. I killed uh, countless mosquitoes, um, uh, you know, scorpions, centipedes, uh, frogs. I swallowed a few tadpoles while I was there. Now, if I remember correctly, yeah. the centipedes in Vietnam are not quite like the centipedes you have here. No. Uh, we no. have here. I mean, I, it looks like I've seen some over a foot long. It's uh, Well, right there's one uh, showing yeah. on the screen. That one's about probably seven inches long, and I yeah. found that in my hooch uh, one morning when I get up. So... Uh, you know, you kind of had to yeah. be careful putting your boots on in the morning. Yeah. But um, uh, anyway, uh, this is Benoit as I'm flying um, in. This was after I took a, a two-week leave. Anyway, that's just to give you an idea that it was kind of a city. This is the green line around uh, Benoit, and uh, I'm not sure what kind of detail you can see on the uh, screen at uh, home there, but... Uh, uh, there was concertina wire and barbed wire all around uh, Benoit, and then bunkers were, and I'm talking about uh, big bunkers, were uh, spaced every so often, and that's where we'd pull our guard well, duty. Benoit was, was Benoit Air Base, but Benoit was also a city next right. to the Air Base, right. which is still in operation today. It's mm -hmm. just operated by the North. Okay, yeah. And this happens to be one of the uh, bunkers that, um, that I stood guard in uh, one night when I was there. Uh, this is also Benoit. These are uh, the uh, barracks uh, that we stayed in. And some of my friends, um, uh, they're from different uh, states and so forth. But, uh, okay, next. Um, okay, and this is a meeting of the uh, Como Department. And um, uh, you can see from the um, hand gestures that uh, there was no shortage of... Uh, uh, respect and disrespect for uh, our superiors. Uh, this is the EM club that uh, was available to the enlisted men. Okay, 
this is the Tactical Operations Center at uh, um, Tuiwa, and uh, and what I'm showing here is really what it looked like uh, in the rear areas, and then uh, we'll get into the fire bases and so forth in a minute. This is at Tuiwa, also one of the major bunkers, and you'll see that there was not uh, uh, the uh, the sandbags uh, all over the roofs and so forth. Uh, this when you, when you say excuse me, when you say Tuiwa, that's the name of uh, a village, a town. Well, it, it was a. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether it was an actual native village or town there, but it was a place where we had a major military installation. Okay. And I was there helping to pull a stand down while the unit. Where, where was that in, 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 in it was not It was on the coast. On the coast? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, and here you see a, a demonstration of some um, uh, sentry dogs, uh, and they're going after the guy with the protective gear on and so forth. Uh, and now come to the fire support bases. Uh, this is, um, I'm not sure whether this is a shower or the crapper. I mean, you got the lav lavatory right there. If it was a crapper, that's not a good place to have a lavatory. Uh, shower would make more sense to me. Um, this is Firebase Sherman taken from the outside. And here, at least, we were sort of on a incline, and we had a uh, way to let the water drain off of the uh, Firebase, uh, you know, away from us, so it's not like some of the other um, pictures you'll see in a minute. Uh, of course, as you know, uh, Bill, um, uh, one of the uh, jobs we had in way of sanitation was burning the, the uh, excrement that accumulated in the uh, in the Excellent. crappers. That's that's a big word for word crap. <laughs> yeah. So here's a crapper uh, that uh, apparently whoever was burning it got a little too close to the crapper itself and set the crapper on fire. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is me uh, shaving and. Uh, You'll notice that uh, I'm using a uh, steel pot a helmet as my uh, sink. And, uh, you know, I heard uh, 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 someone being interviewed by uh, Ken Burns several years ago about World War II, and he was talking about uh, the many uses of the, uh, the helmet, how it could be uh, used as a hammer, a, uh, a shovel, um, uh, different things, and one day you'd be uh, taking a crap in, in it, the next day you'd be eating out of it. Now, I, I confess, I did not do that, but uh, I thought it was rather humorous that he yeah. mentioned that. Okay, here I am at uh, Firebase uh, Katy. Uh, this is underground, and I'm just working the radios uh, at that firebase. Um, this is a picture of my boots uh, taken from inside of my hooch, and you can see the rain splattering there. Um, and that is inside of Hooch. That's where uh, I lived, and a good friend of mine, Dave Feeler, uh, was my Hooch mate uh, there. But that's those were the living conditions we had. And those air mattresses set up on the side? Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is Firebase Pecos here. And, in fact, if you look to the right, you'll see this uh, steel culvert uh, that's uncovered. And that was a Hooch in the making there. Uh, we would put... Uh, plastic over that, and then uh, several layers of sandbags, and that would uh, be home for a while. Looks like that was during the rainy season. Yeah, it definitely was. Uh, this is Firebase Pat, uh, and this was probably within the, the first day or so. You can see that we're just beginning construction uh, there, and I was there for two weeks, and you're about to see some pictures that illustrate the rainy season. Uh, there I am sitting on top of my hooch, and you can see the mud uh, coming um, uh, halfway up my, my shin. Uh, that's a picture that was taken of Firebase Pat as I was leaving, uh, and the battalion commander called it an Olympic swimming pool, is the way he referred to it. Uh, that's also Firebase Pat, um, and let's let's just go on. Uh, we just don't have enough time to talk about, about much detail. Firebase Pat, that's also Firebase Pat, but that was taken from where we were filling up sandbags uh, which were more mud bags and sandbags, uh, but that's a, a shot of the... Okay, there I am with a um, sandbag and a shovel, and you can possibly see how lumpy the sandbag is, and that's because it, we were filling up with mud uh, that was real sticky mud instead of um, um, sand. This is uh, what we called a mule, 
uh, and that was used for hauling stuff around the fire base, uh, ammo, water, you know, whatever needed to be hauled around. That was a little four-wheel vehicle. There I am standing in front of my uh, hooch um, uh, to give you an indication of how deep the mud was. Um, again, Firebase uh, Pat, um, and I think that's the same picture I saw earlier. Okay, this is Firebase Pecos, and somehow or another somebody got um, um, a cot. I'm not sure how they got that, but they must have been um, kind of a... Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is Firebase uh, Brazos, I think, uh, at the very beginning. Of that, so that that gives you some idea of what the living conditions were mm -hmm. on uh, some of the fire bases. Uh, now, uh, these are some of the weapons. Uh, this was a, a mortar. You can see the guy dropping the um, round down the mortar tube. Um, uh, yeah, just keep going. Uh, this is a, a one one five five howitzer, I think. Um, yeah, that's one five five. This is a 105 here that's actually on a firing mission. Um, and if you look in the sky, there's a little uh, puff of uh, white um, cloud. That's a, a white phosphorus or a Willie peat uh, round. It's a marking round. Uh, somehow or another, the forward observers are able to uh, calculate from that where a, an HE or high explosive round would actually land. Uh, this is me firing an 8-inch howitzer on a firebase uh, pace, uh, which was about 100 yards from the Cambodian border. Um, this is a 175 uh, howitzer. This one would shoot, I think, about 39 miles. And um, we had, uh, there were 299 of us on the firebase, according to uh, official records, the, at a maximum. And we were surrounded by 1,500 North Vietnamese in the, in the tree line. Behind them, there were any aircraft units that were shooting our choppers down as we came in. And uh, behind them, uh, there were two divisions of North Vietnamese regulars. So basically, there were 299 of us against about 25,000 of them. Uh, however, the B-52 carpet bombing uh, was a great equalizer. Uh, this is napalm. Uh, sometimes we would uh, bury napalm uh, barrels of napalm around the firebase so that if we were overrun, they could be detonated from within the firebase. And uh, you definitely did not want to get that sticky, jellied gas on you. Uh, and that's just taken a couple of seconds after the first explosion there. Mm. Uh, choppers, this is a loach bird. They buzzed the treetops trying to draw fire from uh, the enemy, and they worked in tandem with uh, the um, Cobra gunships. And once the Cobra gunships knew where the enemy was, uh, they uh, zeroed in on them and uh, did them some harm. Uh, this is a, a Huey Slick, a UH-1 helicopter. Uh, this was taken as I was flying into Firebase Pace, and um, you can see how we set in the helicopter. Uh, there was no uh, buckles or ropes or anything securing us there, and I tell you, one of the scariest things for me was when the, uh, thanks for the sound effects. <laughs> when the uh, helicopter would bank and I was on the lower side, yeah. and you just felt like you were going to slide out, and you were reaching behind you and so forth, trying to grab onto something. Um, I don't know of anybody who slid out, but um, it was pretty scary. This is a gaggle of uh, choppers coming into Firebase uh, Katy here, if I recall. Uh, that's a Cobra gunship uh, at, the, at a distance. That's not a very good shot of one. This is a uh, Chinook uh, 54, uh, so it had the double rotor, rotor um, system on it. We had another name for them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what was that, Bill? Uh, shit hooks. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is inside of the uh, uh, CH-54 uh, Chinook. This is a CH-54, and these things were monsters. They could lift uh, caterpillars and earth moving equipment and so forth it was it was quite uh, yeah, the a flying, piece of machine flying crane is, is something to see yes. right and you as an engineer could really appreciate that uh, now in the bush i don't have many pictures uh, of the bush because i took my camera out uh, out there and i had to keep it in an ammo can 
uh, to keep it protected from all the, the rain and so forth. It had to go in the bottom of my rucksack. It was just a hassle, and it was that much more weight. Uh, I weighed 165 pounds, I think, at the time, and I, when I first went out to the bush, I was carrying somewhere between 120 and 130 pounds on my back. So I've learned from watching and talking to the other GIs that uh, I was carrying way too much weight, so I ditched some of that, and uh, we'll get to the... Uh, uh, the story about the, the water shortage and, and a little bit if we have time. Yeah. Okay, and this is me. I was uh, fixing to uh, go on a mission from Firebase Round Rock is where this is. Uh, rest and relaxation. Uh, I took uh, two uh, R&Rs at uh, Vung Tau, and these are just some pictures of... Uh, How in the world would you do that? No, They really liked you. Uh, well, you spend 45 days out in the bush and you got three days uh, R&R. Okay. Uh, so I paid for it. Yeah, uh, and this is the veil uh, at Vung Tau. Um, you can just go ahead and flip through those pictures, M9, and yeah, Vung, Vung Tau was right on the coast. Yep, uh -huh. beach resort. Yep, sure was. Uh, um, you know, they always talked about the Viet Cong used one end of the beach, and and we used the other end of the beach for R and R. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the only USO show that I saw. These were a couple of uh, magicians. Uh, that uh, showed up. This was not exactly the Bob Hope show, but it's the best we had. These are a couple of donut dollies that came out of Firebase Sherman, uh, the first Firebase I was on. This is the only time I saw donut dollies while I was in Vietnam. Now those were girls that the Red Cross sent out to uh, serve uh, or play games and so forth. Exactly, That's... right, to, to uh, lift our morale and so yeah. forth. And they, they did a great job, and I appreciate uh, what they did, although they had uh, some names that... Uh, uh, were not very respectful, uh, such as, uh, yeah. um, you know, um, well, uh, the, oh, when we'll, it comes to mind. We'll, 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 <laughs> okay. we'll, yeah, we'll let it go on that one. Okay, uh, all right. But it was nice to see a round-eyed round female either You way. bet, you bet. Uh, this is a flying PX. I only saw this one time. This was at Firebase Katy. And uh, this is uh, Thanksgiving dinner in 1971. Uh, not mom's cooking, but pretty good. Uh, these were some of the Vietnamese people. You can just go through there, and I'll show you. Uh, this is my favorite picture here. You apparently can't see the can, but uh, uh, our platoon sergeant gave this uh, baby son here uh, a swig of his Black Label beer, and you can tell from his expression, it's probably the first time he had had a Black Label. Uh, and there I am sitting beside a mama son that uh, they were... Uh, Available at Tuiwa to uh, clean and um, uh, sew patches on our uniforms and that sort of thing. Uh, the picture you just saw was Mung, who was one of the Kit Carson scouts uh, that I knew and had worked with. Uh, and then uh, uh, the one time that I get, did get to uh, really do something in terms of my music was when our three Kit Carson scouts were killed uh, and uh, they were looking for a bugler to play taps. And so my uh, new uh, commo chief uh, told him we had a professional back in uh, uh, his unit, and so he volunteered me to play taps at their funeral. So this was on the other side of Saigon. These are some pictures that were taken uh, as I was traveling to the cemetery to um, play taps. And um, those, those are the um, caskets. There were four, but uh, the fourth one came from another area. That's a pagoda that I took a picture of along the way. That's me playing taps. Uh, and um, uh, that's a Buddhist monk uh, that officiated the service. Uh, okay, and these are pictures of Firebase Pace. This is the, the most notable event that took place in my tour of duty. Uh, it wound up uh, on the national news and... Uh, Newsweek, uh, Time, uh, AP, uh, you know, all the major uh, sources um, of news uh, carried something on it, uh, and that was because there was a issue of as to whether or not a couple of platoons uh, had mutinied or not, to use a strong word. Uh, and now in, seven, in the 70s, uh, you were starting to have uh, drug and race problems, I believe, Uh but not so much in the field. But the uh, Right, right. The further you got out, the less those problems uh, uh, became mm -hmm. because you were dependent on the guy next to yeah, you. I mean, 
uh, he'd already, I think Nixon already announced that we were pulling out and nobody wanted to be the last person to die in Vietnam. That's right. When I was there and at Firebase Pace, which we're looking at here, uh, there were um, 10 to 14,000 troops being withdrawn each month. Uh, and as you said, um, you know, uh, we knew we were not there to win the war and nobody wanted to be the last one to die. Morale was at, at its lowest ebb, I think, and it was hard to maintain a positive attitude when everybody around you was negative. And I was part of that negativity. Uh, my greatest challenge uh, was my attitude, and if I could go back and redo this experience, that's the one thing I would change would be uh, my attitude because it was my choice to uh, be neg negative and uh, to complain. Uh, I was just joining in with the other guys, and they were joining in with me, though. This picture, uh, this is me. Uh, I was getting short uh, at this point, which means I had um, not a whole lot of time left in country before I was coming home, so I thought I'd take that picture. This is customs. Uh, we had to go through customs to uh, get out of Vietnam and come home. This is the last sunset that I saw in uh, Vietnam. It may not be the most picturesque um, slide that you might see, but it was a pretty beautiful picture to me. And this is me as I'm... Uh, getting ready to come home, and I'm wearing my khakis. And this is Travis Air Force Base, um, where I'd come up, disembark from the plane, turn around, and uh, took that uh, picture. So I think that's the end of uh, those slides. So. Well, those were good. Uh, I'm glad you brought them. Um, I, yeah, I wanted to uh, bring that up because well, you and I had talked about it before. Whenever I went out in the bush with, mm -hmm. as an engineer, where they knew we won't have no sense in the bush, so we went, always went out with the Ninth Infantry, uh, ninth infantry uh -huh. guys, and I always carried two canteens. Uh -huh. And I have my own uh, Kool-Aid story. Haven't okay. touched Kool-Aid since then. <laughs> uh, but uh, yours is a little different than mine. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I usually tell people, you know, when you get thirsty in Vietnam, you find a, a stream which it was brown, yucky, smelly water with creepy crawlers in it, but you mm -hmm. couldn't even find the stream. Yeah, right, tell us a little right. bit about the situation and uh, the urinate story. Okay. Well... Um, we were on a, a mission, uh, and it seemed that all the other units uh, in the the first cab uh, were in contact with the enemy, and so they were top priority as far as uh, um, getting support from uh, the firebase and so forth. And that included the uh, Logbird bringing supplies and food and water and so forth to us. Um, well, not water. We usually had water uh, in the bush, but... Uh, at any rate, uh, we had gone for three full days. We were into the fourth day without food and water. And uh, so our um, platoon leader uh, saw that dehydration was beginning to be uh, an issue. And so uh, he said, okay, uh, guys, we have no other choice because we don't have any water. There's been no rain. We're around no streams. Uh, and by the way, we were not trained for survival. So there might have been some techniques that uh, could have been used that we just didn't know about. So anyway, um, we all got our, contact, our uh, canteen cups out, um, uh, urinated in, in those. Um, we did have some purification tablets. I think I doubled up on those. Um, and I dug around in my, uh, my rucksack, and I did find a package of uh, grape Kool-Aid. So I mixed all, that all together, um, and... Uh, that's what I call my recipe for urinade, or if you prefer, Pisacola. Um, and it was it was wet, but it was still warm, and it tasted like grape urinade, I suppose. Uh, that's the first and only time that I've um, had that experience. But uh, um, it makes for a good story. Um, Thanks for breaking that up, Bill. Yeah, I just uh, <laughs> and I have my I have my I have my own Kool Aid story, and like I said, uh, from you you were you were awarded the Bronze Star, right? So you must have been halfway decent soldier. Uh, in spite of my attitude, I got my job done. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, now you come home. What did you do after you come home? You came back to you came back to Greensboro, North right. Carolina. Uh, mm -hmm. Will you still have military time left, or? Well, they said I did, but I um, pretty much uh, said I'm not interested in going to any meetings or anything. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I guess they they figured I'd done my time. 
and so forth. So uh, uh, I never did go to any reserve meetings or anything like that. What I did do uh, but was you, go you, to, were, you were discharged from the military when you came home. You were you were well, short, and uh, did you have uh, time here at a, at a base? No, no. Uh, just as I was going through, uh, we came in at Travis, and we went through Fort Ord, I think, to uh, um, uh, exit. Yeah, yeah to, to process process out of the uh, army. Uh, but um, uh, I came home, and uh, I was discharged actually after my six-year obligation was completed. Yeah. Yeah. But um, uh, I went home, and I think I slept for 30 days. Uh, that's all I was interested in, in doing. Um, and uh, I, I was just worn out. Yeah. Uh, when you came home, did you uh, try to explain to your family what you'd gone through or your friends or... How did they accept you coming home? Because uh, anybody that goes off the war like that changes. Right, right. Well, uh, you know, I didn't have some of those bad experiences that uh, you hear and read about, you know, uh, uh, people calling you baby killer and uh, spitting on you and one thing and another. Uh, my friends and family were just glad I, I was home safe. Uh, I deeply regret the fact that I did not talk to uh, my parents or other um, relatives and friends that were so supportive to write to me and so forth. It's just that I didn't know what to say to them, and they didn't know what to ask me. Yeah. And so it was, um, you know, something you just bottle up. Uh, and thank goodness for organizations like the North Carolina Vietnam Veterans that uh, gives us the opportunity to tell our story uh, in so many ways to so many people uh, through the school system and through the um, uh, streaming TV uh, here and yeah. so forth. Well, you know, we found in the past talking with other veterans, we can get together and laugh about mm -hmm. things that people don't understand what we were right. talking about. Right. And uh, going into talking to the school kids and so forth uh, has probably been uh, healing uh, to us and as well as uh, educational for the kids mm -hmm. and uh, talking to other veterans. But it was a long time before we could do that. Yeah, and, and I've would say, and I have expressed this to um, uh, some of the teachers, that uh, the the letters that we usually get from the students, uh, and also their participation in the Lessons of Vietnam class, is the welcome home that I'm getting today that we didn't get mm -hmm. 40 some years ago, yeah. you know, and, and I greatly appreciate uh, the interest uh, that, uh, you know, the kids have shown, the teachers have shown, and I have found just in general, people are uh, very curious, interested in uh, knowing what we uh, went through and, and so forth. So, uh, you know, I think things have turned around, and I think it's been very helpful to our uh, currently serving troops. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this. When you came home and you, uh, did you go end up in a band? Uh, yeah. Um, the first thing was that uh, the Winston-Salem Symphony uh, contacted me. They heard I was back in town and asked me to play the summer season with them. Uh, and then uh, I was uh, contacted by the superintendent of the Goldsboro, Goldsboro um, City Schools, and they were looking for a band director. And I turned him down for like three weeks uh, and finally just found, felt so sorry for him that uh, uh, I agreed to come down and do the band program. Uh, while I was in Goldsboro, I did play in a, a small uh, band. Um, and then I moved back to Greensboro after I uh, taught for one year in a row, is the way I like to put it. Um, so I came back to Greensboro, and I played with uh, Burton Massengale's band uh, for, I think it's about, I played about 15 months, I, I think, and uh, figured out if I wanted to have a family and uh, 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 the kind of lifestyle that um, I thought they deserved, I need to find myself a, a real day job. Mm -hmm. so, so I got that out of my system. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. Well, we're running short on time. Sure. I just want to ask you one more question, and we'll just and that'll probably finish this out. Uh, I remember the day that I got that we saw, I saw the news that Saigon fell, mm -hmm. and I remember the feeling. Uh, now we're looking back. We did the same thing. We pulled out. We announced we were pulling out. We pulled out and. Uh, of Vietnam, I, I personally think we uh, kind of walked off and left the Vietnamese. 
Oh, okay. okay. Uh, and now today we uh, got the situation in Iraq. We just kind of uh, announced we were pulling out and pulled mm -hmm. out and uh, didn't leave a whole lot of troops there. And it's almost the same thing as happening. I agree. Uh, I mean, I, I say to myself, what are you thinking? Did you, did you not know history? Yeah. Um, it's, it's really sickening, to tell you the truth, to, to see the same thing happen over again. And that's, that's what I see. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of talk going on about doing the war, about the civilians were killed. But from what I have uh, studied, that when we left, after uh, Vietnam fell to the North, North uh, the communists, there were more people killed, more of the Vietnamese were killed after that than during the war. Uh -huh. And somewhat, I, I have the same feeling that some of the same things are going to happen uh, in Iraq and so forth. Uh, right. Because right. everybody that helped the Americans during the Vietnam War, his name went down in somebody's book. Right. And I, I have a feeling it's going to be the same way in Iraq. And it's, uh, uh, we always talked about, you know, you study history so you don't repeat itself. But right. uh, it seems like our, our leaders uh, have done a whole lot of studying of history. Seems that way to me, too. Yeah. Yep. Well, Paul, I appreciate you uh, coming in and talking with us tonight. We didn't hardly even scratch the surface. Yep. But uh, we were, our next show is uh, July uh, 9th. We'll have another guest. Uh, just wanted to tell everybody that we will be at State Capitol in Raleigh uh, July 4th for our, our, our normal POW MIA ceremony, except instead of being at 12 o'clock as normal, uh, they're having a nationalization ceremony at 12. We will be doing our calling out of the names at 12.45. We will be right back there the next day, July 5th, for our normal POW monthly service that we've been doing for 27 years at 12 o'clock. And on the, uh, on the 4th of July, we will have the 1-8th replica of the Vietnam Wall. Uh, it's in D.C. We will have that at the Capitol and hopefully being able to give you printouts uh, July 12th, we will be in Wilson, North Carolina, uh, working with the American Legion Post 13 there, uh, right off uh, 301 Highway, right across from Parker's Barbecue uh, at the fairgrounds. We'll be there with the wall uh, all day on the uh, uh, July 12th. So that's opportunities. If you haven't seen the wall in D.C., come see our wall. Uh, be sure to tune in next show and tell all your friends about us. Uh, we try to reach out and touch uh, different aspects of Vietnam, the Vietnam War, and most important, the men and women who served our country in Vietnam. Again, thank you for watching our show, and good night, good morning, whatever time you're watching this. Thank you for tuning in. Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Help In with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, The Tanya Love Show, Reawaken Your Brilliance with Julie Seibert, and if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com Sponsored by Atomus.com Makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals That vidblasterguy.com CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net